And good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? I didn't have my bumper set, so I didn't turn that on. How's everybody doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for coming back to class. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope everybody had a good holiday weekend. I see that uh, looks to me like, who is that? Uh, Becky is trying to get into a new walking routine with her dog. That's a great idea, a good exercise for the puppy. Uh, keep him from tearing up the house, and it's also good for you, Becky. Keep up that good work. Hope everybody's doing well today. Good to see you, Jordan, Sherry, Christine, Erica, John, Jennifer, Christina, Becky, Ashley. Wow, it's great to see everybody. Dre Khan, thanks for coming. April Kruger, I see you are in the house today. Fantastic. Welcome back. We are in week three. Holy cow, we are making progress through this course, I'm telling you. Uh, so we did the introduction to psychology where I talked about the different subfields, and we had a quick introduction to the brain last week. We're going to continue on in the biological trend this week by talking about consciousness, which is a function of this biological structure that you have in your brain. And so we're going to talk a little bit about states of consciousness today, and then on two, Thursday, we're going to focus specifically on sleep. And you know, Becky, if you want to be in good health, along with getting lots of exercise, you also need to get good sleep. How many of you sleep less than seven hours a day? Anybody get less than seven? Anybody get less than six? Go ahead and type in the chat bar letting us know. You know, getting enough sleep is another thing that is important for your health. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, I sent around a video earlier this morning. How many of you watched, took the awareness test this morning? Did you take the awareness test? Yes or no? And after that, less than six. Holy cow. Becky's been sleeping terrible lately. It's hard to fall asleep. I am so sorry. Less than six for Carly. That's terrible. Terrible. I'm so sorry. I hope you feel all right during the day. Okay, so we watched that video. How many of you failed to see the dancing bear? And if you've watched it before, just think back to the first time you took the test. Did you see the dancing bear or did you miss the dancing bear? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Did you see it? or miss it. See it or miss it. <clears throat> April watched it. Jennifer watched it. Kara watched it. Amala watched it. Becky did. Okay, fantastic. Christine watched it. Oh, you still missed it. I never saw it even in the replay. Ha ha. Okay, we missed it. Wow. Fantastic. Right. You know what, folks? You are just like me. I missed the dancing bear the first time uh, that I watched it as well. Okay. Um, how could that possibly happen? How could something wander across your face slowly and still you don't see it? Okay. It's because it didn't get into your consciousness. That is That uh, study is a demonstration of what we call selective inattention. Sometimes if you're asked to direct your attention in one area, you will completely miss an obvious part of your environment because you are not paying attention to it. Selective inattention. And there are tons of videos I could share with you that will demonstrate this concept of selective attention. And this, in a sense, kicks off this week's lecture because this week's lecture, we're going to be talking about consciousness. And consciousness is all about awareness. It's your awareness of your internal state. It's your awareness of your external state. And what I'm going to try to suggest to you in this week's lecture is that your consciousness is really rather limited. And if you actually watch the video uh, for this week's discussion board, I'm going to suggest to you that maybe what you think of your as your consciousness is just a hallucination. I don't know if any of you have already watched the uh, TED Talk video that I sent around in an, in an announcement last night, 
but we're going to be watching a TED Talk video called uh, You Hallucinate Your Consciousness. And the whole point that I'm going to try to make this week is that this consciousness, this awareness that we have is a, is a limited quality that we use to get as close an approximation of reality as we possibly can. And that this thing called consciousness works in very systematic ways that we need to be aware of in order to make full use of our consciousness. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be conscious. We're going to talk about the global space model of consciousness. We're going to talk a little bit about how people with split corpus callosums demonstrate the nature of consciousness. And then we're going to talk a little bit about altered states of consciousness. Everybody ready for today? Go ahead and give me a uh, thumbs up on the chat bar to let me know that you're fired up about today's talk. And if you're not, fake it. If you're not, fake it. Okay. Now, uh, here's the crazy thing. Uh, consciousness is a very slippery thing even to describe, much less to study. And in fact, until recently, uh, and the gentleman that you saw the TED Talk video would disagree with me, there are people who suggest that consciousness is impossible to study scientifically simply because it can't be described. In order to study something scientifically, you have to be able to define what it is. And consciousness is a very difficult thing to define, and it's unique for each and every individual. Okay? So, now, although there's no universal agreement on what consciousness is, I can give you sort of a general description um, of what it is. And it's going to be your moment-to-moment -moment awareness of both yourself and your environment. So, consciousness is what you're experiencing right now. No, right now. No, right now. Right? It's that moment-to-moment -moment awareness of yourself and the environment. Now, what makes up our consciousness? Well, your memories. If you're remembering something right now, if you're thinking about what you had for breakfast or what you have to do tonight or what you did this weekend, it's in your conscious awareness. And I am sorry, folks. I actually, oh, my nose is running. I uh, actually came up positive for the coronavirus this past week. And I've been having some mod, some moderate, some moderate signals, so I apologize for that. Ah! Okay, so the memories that you have right now are in your conscious and awareness. We know that consciousness has memory. Consciousness has sensory experiences. You feel the, the heat or the coolness in your apartment. You see the light. You see the color. It's what you're experiencing. Then you're, I know, right? Yeah, I'm going to be fine. Uh, I've been fully vaccinated, so it was very moderate, but not, not that big a deal. I've had a little soreness in the chest and a little headache and a runny nose. Uh, but it's okay. Get yourself vaccinated if you're not. So consciousness, it's your memories. It's your sensory experiences. It's what you think about your memories and your sensory experiences. So if you're looking at a clown and you're laughing and saying, that is the funniest clown I ever saw, you are introspecting, if you will. And then consciousness is intentional. It's you choosing to do certain things in your life and follow certain behavior patterns, okay? So grabbing my coffee cup and taking a drink was an intentional act. When I do that intentionally, it's in my consciousness. And so your consciousness is sort of a combination of your memories, your sensory experiences, how you feel about your memories and your sensory experiences, and as well as your, your intention to do certain things. What does it mean to be aware? Well, you know, um, it's hard to say, but let's just use uh, several terms to sort of discuss what we mean. Um, uh, what does it mean to be aware? Is, uh, is human experience objective or subjective? Is there an objective reality out there or does reality come from inside your mind? Now, there's one approach to, to uh, consciousness called phenomenology where they suggest that each and every person's experience is completely different. For example, how many of you like grapefruit? How many of you don't like grapefruit, 
right? That's an individual experience, conscious experience that each of you have. So your phenomenology, does each and every one of us experience green or purple or the sound of a car horn the same way? Or does each and every one of us have a unique experience of this, right? So we're going to talk about consciousness in terms of being a phenomenological or subjective experience or whether or not there is an objective reality. The guy that you watch uh, uh, give the TED Talk is going to suggest that there's a certain degree of subjectivity to our experience. Now, we also, people talk about the minimum qualities. What does it mean to have consciousness? You and I have consciousness, and recently, until recently, most scientists thought that human beings were the only one that really experienced true consciousness. But you know what? Pets, like dogs, they experience a certain level of consciousness. Uh, rats, any organism that responds to an environmental cue, in a sense, has a certain level of of consciousness. So what are the minimum qualities that we can use to describe consciousness? I don't know if you folks uh, uh, have ever seen this, but I watched the, the documentary Fantastic Fungi a couple of weeks ago, and they actually suggested that trees talk to one another using the root structures of mushrooms. If trees can talk and communicate with one another, what kind of consciousness do we say they have? So we have to decide what it is we mean by consciousness. And then here's one thing I want you to keep in mind. Consciousness is not created by a little person in your head watching your world. How many of you feel like you are in charge of your awareness? I am aware. If you say I am aware, who is the I you are talking about? If you're talking about somebody in your head watching and listening to your experience like it's a movie, that's not the right way to think about consciousness. If you think about it, you're creating a problem we call the ghost in the machine. Who's watching the consciousness in your brain? And if that person's watching the consciousness, who's watching the consciousness in that person's brain? So at some point, what we have to do is we have to realize that consciousness arises from brain tissue. And you are not, in a sense, really in control of your consciousness any more than you're in control of your brain. Now, how are we going to compare consciousness? Well, we can talk about conscious versus unconscious awareness. There are a lot of us who have things that are bothering us that control our behavior. But how many of you have really bad, terrible, traumatic events like me uh, that hurt, happened early in life? that affect the way you behave, even though you don't think about those things. We all have traumatic events that occurred in our life, and they affect our behavior, even though we're not aware of them. So we're going to talk about what we are consciously aware of, and we're going to talk about those things that are unconscious that still drive our behavior. And then psychologists spend a lot of time talking about uh, the different types of consciousness. Self-induced consciousness. So if any of you uh, practice meditation, if any of you go to a hypnotist, you are inducing a different level of consciousness. Uh, then we can study the kind of consciousness that you have right now as you're listening to me. And then, you know, what? we can even study people who have lost a sense of consciousness uh, because of brain damage. OK, and in fact, uh, I even want to suggest that your intentions to do things even arise before you are aware of them. So I just picked up this cup of coffee to take a drink. I consciously became aware that I wanted a drink of coffee. It actually turns out that my brain became active. My hand that was going to move my, uh, my brain area that was going to move my hand to my cup of coffee actually became active even before I knew I wanted a sip of coffee. So the weird thing is, your brain drives your consciousness. Now, let's talk about uh, an idea. What exactly is consciousness? Now, if you're like me, you have the experience of your consciousness bouncing all over the place. You're probably paying attention to me a little bit, but you're also probably paying attention to your phone. So your consciousness goes from uh, me to your phone, to me to your phone. Then you may hear your mom say something, and suddenly you're thinking about what your mom's going to say. And then you think about that uh, 
than the thought that uh, John insulted you last week and that really pisses you off and that pops into your mind. Have any of you had that experience where your consciousness kind of bounces around all over the place? Most of you probably can't, quote, pay attention. If you're like me, you've had that experience. Consciousness sort of bounces all around the place. And so the question is, where exactly does consciousness in the brain exist? If you'll remember last week, I suggested to you the idea of localization. I said the different parts of your brain control different aspects of your conscious functioning. The answer for consciousness is that it is controlled everywhere. And one model which seeks to sort of describe that characteristic is what's known as the global weight workspace model. And what they argue is that consciousness is a fluid process that occurs in many parts of the brain. So where does your consciousness lie? Well, if you're paying attention and looking at me, your consciousness is in your visual cortex and your auditory cortex because you're paying attention. If you suddenly... Uh, uh, are focusing on picking up your cup of coffee, your consciousness is in your motor cortex. If you suddenly feel itchy, your consciousness is in your sensory cortex. So in the global workspace model, what they suggest is that consciousness uh, the, occurs in different parts of the brain. And as we focus on different areas of our consciousness, different areas of our brain become active. Do you see that picture I have over on the far side of the uh, screen? By the way, uh, Becky says she has trouble paying attention. You are completely normal. And if any of you folks think that you have difficulty paying attention and I just can't focus, here's what I'd like to let you in on. You're not supposed to focus. If you think about it, uh, attention is better if it's bouncing around. Why would it be better for you not to get too focused on one thing? Can anybody come up with an evolutionary explanation why our conscious awareness is so fragile and bounces around to so many things in our environment? Why would that be a useful thing? So, Becky, you are definitely not alone. And as you're focusing on different things, Becky, uh, different parts of your brain are, quote, holding the consciousness. OK, now, Tong. In 1988, you lose awareness of the rest of your surroundings, survival instinct, to stay alert. Absolutely. If any of you have ever tried to sneak up on a wild animal, a bird or a squirrel or a mouse, you'll notice that that animal notices you long before you get close to them. But if that mouse was totally focused on what it was looking at, you'd be able to sneak up on it. But you can't. Absolutely. I see we've got a lot of scientists already here. Becky Forsberg, Callie Hue Carly Huecki, uh, Amber, and uh, April all figure the answer out. Good job. Very good job. So here's the deal. Looking at this picture over here, uh, scientists uh, had people look at the picture of a house and they measured their brain activity with a PET scan and found out what part of their brain was active when they were looking at the house. They then had them look at the picture of the face and they measured where in the brain uh, uh, the, the person's brain, which part of the brain was active when the person uh, looked at the face. And if you folks remember, when you look at a face, your fusiform gyrus in your temporal lobe is activated. And when you look at a house, just an object, your memory center, your temporal lobe, your larger temporal lobe would be activated. So what they did was they measured where in a person's brain uh, they saw activity when they were looking at a house and a face. They then showed people a superimposed image, the image at the top. And if you look closely at that image, you'll see that there's the image of the house and the image of the face. And what they did was they asked people to look at this picture and said, tell me what you see. And then they measured the people's brain activity. And what they found was that some people said they saw the house and some people said they saw the face. And what they found was that those people who saw the face, their temporal lobe, their fusiform gyrus was being active. And when people said they saw the house, their larger temporal lobe was being active. So this, in a sense was demonstration that people's conscious awareness was controlled by what part of their brain was being active at the given time. Now, here's the crazy thing about your consciousness. The left hemisphere of your brain controls your right body. Remember that? 
and your right hemisphere of your brain controls your left body. That's called a contralateral design, okay? Now, in order to work together and to have a, a fully functional body, your right half and your left half of your body need to work together and the sensations need to be shared. So, the part of your brain that connects your left and right half of your brain is called the corpus callosum. It's a band of axons that connect your left brain with your right brain. And what that does is that allows your right brain to tell your left brain what's going on in the part of the body it doesn't control. And your left brain can tell your right brain what's going on in the part of the brain it controls. So we have this holistic, wonderful behavior. Well, check this out. If you look back and divide a put a straight line down your field of vision, everything on the left side of your field of vision, your left hemifield, is being perceived by your right brain. And everything to the right of that line in your right hemifield is being pro processed and perceived by your left hemisphere. So your consciousness is split into a left and a right half. So part of my brain is conscious of my left world and part of my brain is conscious, conscious of my right world. All right. Now, most of the time we don't notice because they're both together. But here's what happens. Occasionally, people have, uh, people have uh, disorders which require the severing of the corpus callosum. And what happens is when you sever a person's corpus callosum, they look normal until you ask them to do a special vision test. Now, what they do is, and if you look at this picture of this person right below me, you'll notice that they're looking at a computer screen. And do you see there's a teeny tiny black dot in the middle of that computer screen? Well, what they ha do is have the person stare at that black dot. And then they show them images on the computer screen. Now, if you're staring at the black dot, the house picture is on the left side of your field of vision, and it goes to your the right half of your brain. And if this person is looking at the black dot, the chicken leg, okay, on the right side of their screen is going to their left side of their brain. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, in experiments, what happens is, if you ask the person to name objects that they are looking at and put them in the right and left half of the hemisphere, different things will happen. It turns out that language is processed in the left half of your brain. Broca's area and Wernicke's area are typically in the left half of your brain. What this means is that this part of your brain is verbal and this part of your brain can't talk about what it sees. So what they do is they show people these pictures and if you ask this person right here, uh, this split brain person, <coughs> to name uh, what they were looking at on the right side of their screen, they would be able to say, I'm looking at a chicken foot. But because the information goes from the right hemifield to the left visual world, and they can talk about that. If you ask this person to tell you what they were seeing on the left side of that screen, that house would go to the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere can't talk. Since the corpus callosum is severed, it can't tell the other side of the brain what it's looking at. So if you ask this person, what do you see on the left side of the screen? They will say, I see nothing. I see nothing. That's because their conscious part of their brain that can talk about what they see doesn't see anything. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, and so split brain patient patient uh, uh, experiments and split brain patients demonstrate this bizarre phenomenon of consciousness that if we can't talk about it and somebody asks us, we in a sense come to the conclusion that we never saw it. Now, there's a cra another crazy uh, uh, demonstration of the I, of this bizarre nature of, of uh, consciousness called hemi neglect. Now, some people get a stroke on the right side of their brain. And when these people get a stroke and the stroke occurs on the right side of the brain in the parietal lobe, these people develop a condition called hemi-neglect. Hemi-neglect. 
And the crazy thing is, these people, uh, these people will actually neglect an entire half of their visual field. An entire half of their visual field. So if you ask a person with hemi neglect to draw a house, this is what they would draw for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, so if I had right hemi neglect, if you asked me, I would draw a house and I would do this right here. So you're looking at the, let's see, the left. Actually, I'm drawing it backwards. If you ask me to draw a house, what I would do is I would draw something like this. Okay. Do you see what I'm drawing right here? Now, let's see. That's the right side. So that's my left side of my brain. What's missing from this house right here? You know what's missing? This is missing. This is missing. The right side of this door is missing. The right side of this window is missing. The right side of this, the left side of this door is missing. So the weird thing is, if you ask somebody with hemi neglect to draw a picture, they would only draw the right side of the house because that's in the left side of their brain. And these people actually ignore one half of their field of vision. It's called hemi neglect. Now, this one final bizarro uh, demonstration of this thing called our divided consciousness, called blind sight. Now, there are some people who have damage to their conscious vision center right here in their occipital lobe, and they lose the ability to see objects in half of their field. They can become blind to half of their field. So if you get right occipital brain damage, you might lose the ability to see everything in the left half of your field. Now, you're not neglecting things. You just can't see them. You are totally blind to these objects. Well, there are certain people who have this. Dis Here's the deal, though. Your vision is also processed unconsciously as well. That is, uh, your visual centers connect to your hands so that your hands can grab things and see things in your, and grab things that your eyes see, right? So in order for you to touch things with your hands, your eyes need to communicate with your hands. Well, the crazy thing is in people with blind sight, this pathway still exists. And the crazy thing is you can show a person a picture and you can say, uh, what do you see? on the left side and they'll say, I can't see anything. But if you ask the person to point at the object, they can point at it, even though they tell you they can't see it. You can move the object in their field of vision. Even though they can't see the object itself, they can actually tell you which direction it's moving in. Is that kind of bizarre? Is that kind of bizarre? So the weird thing is, your perception of movement and location of objects isn't really conscious, but your ability to label and tell me what you're looking at is conscious. And so all three of these things, split brain, split, split brain patients, hemi-neglect patients, and blind sign show us that our consciousness is kind of divided into different parts of our brain. And damage to different parts of our brain will cause bizarro consciousness effects to occur. All right. Now, why is it that you missed the, uh, the, the dancing bear? Well, here's the deal. We only have a limited amount of consciousness. If you've ever tried to pay attention to something, you know it's really hard to focus. And you can't focus on a lot of things at the same time. And so human beings have developed this habit of being what we'll call cognitive misers. We spend our attentional energy in the areas where we think we need it the most. And everything else we turn into automatic. How many of you have ever done something without thinking about it? Maybe you made a pot of coffee uh, while your mind was somewhere else. Maybe you were writing a homework assignment, but you weren't really thinking about it. How many of you have walked the dog or cooked dinner without actually thinking about what you're doing? Has anybody ever done something funny?
because they weren't paying attention to what they were doing. It turns out we can automate lots of our behavior. And so that way we only have to spend our very valuable consciousness in one area that's useful to us. Now, the crazy thing about this is if we learn to focus at something, if we learn to focus on something, a lot of times we lose the sight of other things that are happening in our environment because we limit our consciousness. So you are not aware of everything in your environment. Keep that in mind. You are only aware of certain things that are going on in your environment. Now, one big example of this uh, of this uh, chain of, of of this of this limitation of consciousness is what's now known as change blindness. Change blindness. Now, if you look in this picture way down here, what they do is they do this experiment where a person, a strange, a person will walk up to a stranger and begin asking them for directions, and then they have this bizarro situation where two people carrying a huge piece of plywood will actually walk in between. The uh, person asking the question and the person being asked the question. And then if you'll notice, what they do is when this big plywood is coming uh, past here, they do a quick change. Notice in the, in the first pane, it's the person with the brown jacket. They, as they start asking the question, they're in the brown jacket. The person comes through with the plywood and they switch it out. So they're now talking to a different person. Do you see that? And what they find is that 50% of the people who are talking to one person don't realize when the person has changed. People are blind to change that occurs in their environment. People are often unaware of small changes in their environment from moment to moment. This is what's known as change blindness. Now, you folks uh, experience what we call inattentional blindness, with the, uh, with the uh, um, uh, uh, dancing bear study. Basically, I asked you to pay attention to everything dressed in white. And because you were focused on things that were white, you didn't notice the black dancing bear walking right through the middle of your environment. So change blindness and inattentional blindness show us how when we focus our consciousness in one place, we often miss other very obvious things in our environment. And what I'm going to ask you to do this week in webinars, we're going to talk about this inattentional blindness as it relates to political affiliation. Because you know what? I believe uh, conservatives and liberals both have blind spots, areas where they don't pay attention to obvious parts of the environment because they're so focused on their point of view. And we're going to talk about consciousness, the nature of reality, and how it relates to politics in webinar this week. Exactly. Even when looking for something. That's a great point, uh, Ronique. Uh, sometimes you can be looking for something, and because you're not looking for it in a certain place, you'll just completely miss it. Now, I'd like to spend the last 15 or 20 minutes talking about different forms of consciousness. So, uh, there are lots of different kinds of levels of consciousness. So we could talk about being conscious, things that are conscious, like me knowing that I'm looking at my coffee cup, right? And from my hand being able to pick up my cup, coffee cup, that's conscious versus unconscious, right? Uh, we can talk about uh, not being uh, 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 the focus. So we can talk about conscious versus unconscious, or we can talk about altered states of consciousness. What are different types of altered states of consciousness? Well, when we go to sleep, our level of consciousness changes, and we're going to talk about that on Thursday. When we meditate, uh, we change our level, our, our type of consciousness. And when we're hypnotized, people, some people say that uh, our level of consciousness changes, right? And if you've ever really been focused on something that's very, very interesting, uh, you've achieved a different level of consciousness. We're going to talk about these for the last 15 minutes. Do any of you out there meditate? How many of you meditate out there? You know, I started meditating about six or seven years ago. I go to this hippy-dippy uh, science camp, uh, this uh, uh, resort community, uh, educational resort, 
up in New York every summer called the Chautauqua Institution. And one of the things that I do there is every morning I get up at seven o'clock and I go meditate with the Swami. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so I've been meditating and it's a very interesting practice to attempt. I literally have a paper to do on meditation. Sweet. Hitch in your sweet spot, Drakon. Becky. Uh, well, you know, that's the thing. Uh, meditation, if you can't find the time, that means you need to meditate all the more. And you can meditate 15 or 20 minutes. So, what exactly is meditation? Well, Becky, you told me that you can't focus or pay attention to anything. That's because you need to... Uh, you, that's because the nature of the mind is to thrash around a bit and focus on different things. So look at this quote uh, from the Buddhist scripture. The mind is like a fish out of water that thrashes and throws itself about, its thoughts following each of its craving. Such a mind is unsteady. To calm the mind is the true way of happiness. Putting a bridle on the wandering mind, single-mindedly the practitioner restrains her thoughts. She contains their darting waywardness and finds peace. So here's what meditation is. Meditation is learning how to control the thrashing of your consciousness. So, Becky, you can't control your mind. It's bouncing all around everywhere. Mine is doing the same thing. Each and every one of you, uh, your mind is doing the same thing. Well, the practice of meditation is learning how to sit and become quiet and practicing controlling your thoughts, so to speak. All right. Uh, and there's different forms of meditation, so that's a simplistic statement for any of you who know a lot about meditation. But in a sense, what you're learning how to do is to put a bridle or a yoke on your thoughts and to sort of slow them down. So it's an altered state of consciousness, and the practice is learning how to control one's consciousness, yoking the mind. Now, um, so really what you do is you learn to sit, and you'll do two, two different kinds of meditation. Uh, well, excuse me, several different kinds, but one of them is focused meditation. And that's where you will focus on an object, usually your, the tip of your nose, or you will repeat a mantra over and over again. And what you do is you learn to focus on that one thing. So I'm not thinking about anything because I'm saying that word, om. Or what they would tell us was to count to 10. One, two. Focus on your breathing. And count every time you breathe out. And count to 10 and then start over. And then count to 10 and then start over. Or to focus on your nose. And when you're doing that, you're controlling the movement of your mind. Another one is sort of transcendental meditation. And that's where you let the thoughts come in, but you don't stay with them. You let them go right out. It comes in and it floats by, right? Now, in both of these, you're in a sense controlling your mind, your conscious awareness. You're not letting it bounce around. And the crazy thing is, is that the regular practice of meditation... <coughs> is going to make you feel better, and it's also going to make your body healthier. So it turns out the, the regular practice of meditation improves your, your blood pressure, causes your blood pressure to drop, it affects your cholesterol level, it affects your glucose level. In a sense, it is a protective factor for heart-related diseases. It's going to decrease your stress, it's going to decrease your negative emotions, and it's going to decrease your depression, if you will. How does it actually do that? Well, look at this picture underneath me right here. This is an fMRI, and you see some different active parts of the brain. We've got at the back of the brain is the posterior cingulate cortex, and what you see at the front part of the brain is the, uh, what do they call that, the medial frontal orbital cortex right there. And these are parts of a part of your brain called the default mode network. Now, if you've ever sat around and, you've, and you don't have anything external think, to think about and you sit down, you ever notice how your mind starts wandering and you start thinking about things and you start thinking about yourself and you start thinking about your problems and all the work you've got to do? Anybody ever had that kind of experience? When you start to ruminate and think about yourself and your life, 
you're engaging a part of your brain called the default mode network. And this is the part of the brain that's most active when you don't have an external task to focus on. And this part of the brain likes to think negative thoughts. And so most of you, when you're alone by yourself, you probably think about things that make you sad. This is the default mode network. And so keeping busy is one way to keep from getting sad because when you're focused on external things, this default mode network isn't as active. But the crazy thing is, if you learn how to focus, to do focused meditation, after a while, what you can do is you can decrease the activity of this default mode network uh, when you're not doing things. So in a sense, you decrease the amount of negative rumination that goes on in your mind. Uh, do any of you have that experience when you're sitting around the house, man, you just think about depressing things? Anybody have that experience? So learning how to mo meditate decreases the frequency of those thoughts when you're sitting around the house. You learn how to meditate and focus the mind. Yep, Erica, see? Right, I do the same thing. I am horrible. I get myself all worked up when I'm home alone, right? Uh, it happens a lot when I'm cutting the grass, too. I'll be outside cutting the grass, and, you know, the grass is so habitual and easy to do on the riding mower that I have plenty of time to think, and I just get angrier and sadder and whatnot in my mind. Yeah, meditation uh, can help decrease this default mode network activity and decrease those negative feelings. Okay. Now, hypnosis. Have any of you ever been hypnotized before? I was hypnotized in the eighth grade. I went to a summer science camp and had a psychologist hypnotize me. And that is actually why I became a psychologist. It was the coolest thing I had ever seen. And that day up at Appalachian State University, I decided that I was going to become a psychologist and find out about this crazy thing called hypnosis. Because the psychologist put us all under as an entire class. There must have been 50 of us. And I don't know how the other people responded to it. But I remember that he had me close my hands and he put my hands in an imaginary vice. And then he told me to try to take my hands apart. And that vice had locked my hands so much that I couldn't move my hands apart. I just absolutely couldn't do it. It was so crazy because I had this imaginary vice holding my hands uh, together. And so uh, hypnosis is a social interaction. Okay, you have a hypnotist and a person being hypnotized. And what happens during this phase, a person responding to expect suggestions experiences a temporary change in memories and perceptive abilities. So I perceive my hands to be closed. I might perceive myself to be a dog. I might remember the time I went to the circus. And so I'm in this altered state of consciousness where I am open to suggestions from another person called a hypnotist. And the question is, does this suggestibility constitute another form of consciousness. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, how is hypnotism used? There are some people who go to hypnotists to lose weight or to quit smoking. And what happens is the hypnotist will put them under, uh, uh, under and they'll be hypnotized, and then they'll be given a suggestion. You don't like smoking cigarettes. You don't want to eat sweet foods anymore. You only want to eat carrots and lettuce. And the idea is this suggestion will live on in the person's mind after they've been brought out of hypnosis. Now, here's the deal. While I was hypnotized, my hands couldn't open because I was in the state of hypnosis. Now, what post-hypnotic suggestions hope is this, this psychological state that I'm experiencing right now as a hypnotized person will exist even after I come out of the hypnotic state, all right? And so what you're going to find is that some people treat therapeutic problems using hypnosis. 
and the evidence really doesn't suggest that this works, okay? So it may be an altered state of consciousness, but you can't really put thoughts in a person's brain that will last outside uh, of this hypnotic state. However, um, uh, researchers have found that you can get some uh, moderate pain-reducing effects using uh, hypnotic analgesia. And so what you do is you put a person uh, under a hypnotic state and then you sort of lead them to uh, believing that they have reduced pain in the parts of their body that are hurting. And it turns out that people who are put in these hypnotic states and given these uh, analgesic suggestions do experience less pain. Now, is this real? I'm not sure, but the crazy thing is if you look in parts of their brain that respond to pain signals, what you will find is that while they're in this hypnotic analgesic state, the parts of their brain that record pain will actually show <coughs> decreased levels of activity, suggesting that their brain really is perceiving less pain. Pain is a conscious experience that we all experience. Okay, now, is hypnosis real? Opinions do vary. Uh, because the effects of post-hypnotic suggestions are modest, uh, because not everybody can be hypnotized, there are some people who argue that hypnosis isn't real. Instead, they argue it's nothing but a, uh, a social interaction where one person is under social pressure to behave in a certain way. So the sociocognitive theory basically says that when they bring you up on stage, you kind of guess your role as a hypnotized person. And so you uh, go into a state of just being highly open to the social situation. I'm sure all of you have done things in crowds before because you don't want to stand out from the group of people. We call that peer pressure. Well, sociocognitive theory of hypnotism says that people are just under peer pressure when they're being hypnotized and they feel an obligation to play a role. So some people say that hypnosis is a fake social experience. On the other hand, we do know that people can disassociate parts of their consciousness. If you've ever heard of people with multiple personality disorders, they will become different people right? They have multiple personalities. And what they do is they dissociate from one personality and move to another personality. The dissociation theory of hypnosis suggests that people's consciousness dissociates and they go into a different area of their conscious awareness. Can hypnosis change your character? Well, here's the thing, uh, uh, Ronique. Uh, while you're under a hypnotic state, you can, be, uh, you can be given hypnotic suggestions where you will act completely out of character. Absolutely. So uh, even let's say you don't cuss, Ronique, maybe I could put you uh, under hypnosis and tell you you were a dirty old sailor and you'd start spewing cuss words out a mile a minute. Uh, and so, in a sense, I could cause you uh, to, to change your character. I could, can, I could suggest that you become shy, and you would start acting shy. So, in a sense, hypnosis can change your character while you're in the state of hypnosis. Now, will it last after you come out of hypnosis? Probably not. And that's why some people don't believe that hypnosis is really real. Uh, but the evidence is inconclusive at this point. Now, I want to talk in the last few minutes that I have, I want to talk about this weird state of consciousness called flow. How many of you have ever been doing something you really like to do and you've lost track of time because you've spent hours doing something? I remember uh, when I was a, a teenage boy, me and my three or four friends would get together and play Dungeons and Dragons on the weekends. This was the 70s before computers, so it was all paper and pencil. And we would get together on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock after school, and we would literally play 
uh, until Sunday morning. And we might fall asleep a couple of times, but we would just start playing Friday afternoon and all of a sudden we'd wait, we'd get up and it'd be like two o'clock Saturday morning. And we'd be like, wow, we've been playing this same game for 18 hours and we haven't even noticed it. You're experiencing a state of flow. If you've ever been in a flow experience, it feels good. You know, writing poems or writing a book or maybe you're doing artwork or making music. Uh, you're in a flow state and that's an altered state of consciousness. It's a highly focused altered state of consciousness when your sense of self and your sense of time diminishes because you're completely focused on uh, a, t a simple task. This is a flow state. Now, here's the deal. When people are in their flow state, they are highly productive. People do their best work. People do their most work. So there are some psychologists called positive psychologists who study these states scientifically, and they think that it's very useful for humans to learn how to get in flow states. Why? Well, it's because a person in a flow state has complete concentration on a task. The weird thing is their entire world comes down to what their body's doing, so they have a merging of action and awareness. These people lose time. They lose their sense of self. You know, if you've ever done something and you're thinking about how people are going to judge you, you're not focused on the task. But people who are in a flow state completely don't think about themselves or what other people think about them, right? People who are in flow states are having fun. It's intrinsically rewarding. And when a person is in a state of flow, they have these amazing godlike feelings of power and control. And so a flow state is this weird type of consciousness when we really get focused on something. We're going to call it super focused or losing yourself in a task. And that's a very unique form of consciousness that people experience. And that's called flow. So I want you folks all to know what flow is. Surely all of you have experienced flow before, right? So all of you have been in that experience where you're so engrossed in something the world drops away. That's a unique form of consciousness. Now, when are we likely to have a, a flow experience? When you're good at something and when you're being challenged to do something. All right. If you're being overwhelmed by something that's too hard, you become too self-conscious and you can't because you're failing and you start evaluating yourself and you can't get in a sense of flow. If something is super duper easy, it's boring and you can't get into it. It's hard to find a sense of flow. But if you're really good at something and you're doing something that's kind of challenging, you're using it to do something that's kind of challenging you are more likely to get into this thing called a state of flow. So, um, it's more likely to happen when you uh, have something that's kind of hard to do and you're really good at doing it, right? And then there are some people who just get into flow states more easily than, our other, than other people. They can lose their sense of self and focus on a task. We call these people autotelic personalities. Okay, but flow is this really cool state. Now, uh, who, what kind of psychologists help us focus on uh, flow? If you look, uh, there are three different kinds of applications that I've seen. Now, in the Montessori education, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Montessori education, but it's child-directed education. And what you do is you let the child pick activities that are at their interest and their level of ability. The teacher doesn't say what we're going to study. The child picks the study based on their interest and ability level. And so in a sense, Montessori education is trying to create situations where kids can learn within the state of flow because people learn more and focus better and, and, and are more effective when they're in this state of flow. Now, if any of you are in sports, have ever played sports, 
one of the things you'll notice is that sometimes you get self-conscious on the sports field and you're worried about whether or not you're doing well and you start thinking about failure and what it's going to feel like if you make an error or drop the ball or miss the shot or fail to score the soccer goal. If you're thinking about all of these things, you are not focused 100% on the sport. So sports psychologists help us learn how to get in the zone. And when you're in the zone, that's just another word for being in a state of flow. So professional athletes have to perform in front of 50, 60, 100,000 people at one time. Holy cow, you can get nervous. And so what these people have to learn how to do is to put their blinders on and focus on just the task at hand. They have to learn how to play their sport with a sense of flow. And if you've ever been a musician before, um, and I'm a crappy musician, I learned a little bit about the guitar, never enough to really play with a group of people. But if you've ever been in a band and you and your brandmates are grooving and you are really getting together and everybody is sort of as one, as a band, uh, sometimes musicians will refer to that great feeling as being in the pocket, man. I was in the pocket. Man, we were in the pocket on that song, and you were all together as one. You were focused on your instruments and the sound and the song. In a sense, a bunch of musicians being in the pocket is another way of saying that these musicians were all in a state of flow. So how does our consciousness change? Well, we can meditate and learn how to control parts of our brain from ruminating and making us feel bad. Some people can hypnotize us and actually cause us to experience sensory experiences, which are different, right? And then sometimes, if we focus and are really into an activity, our consciousness can change and become narrowly focused on whatever activity is that's engrossing our attention. And on Friday and on Thursday, we're going to talk about this one final crazy form of consciousness that we call sleep that we engage in every night for somewhere between four to eight hours a night. So does anybody have any questions about consciousness? You're in the zone. There you go. Ron uses in the zone. I like that. Okay, anybody have any questions about consciousness? How many of you are going to go out and try to meditate? How many of you would like to be hypnotized? How many of you want to get in the pocket more often and find the zone, right? All right. <clears throat> That's all I have to say. If you are coming to webinar be on Wednesday night, be sure to watch the, uh, the TED Talk video before you come to class on Wednesday night because we're going to be talking about this crazy thing called consciousness on Wednesday night. Uh, if you can't come Wednesday night, remember we are holding the webinar on Thursday night. And, of course, I'll be talking about sleep and dream on Thursday morning. John's going to try to meditate, which I think is an awesome idea. And the rest of you really should, uh, too. I'm a highly anxious, emotional person with a bad temper. And so uh, I need to meditate. And if you're the kind of person that thinks there's no way I could meditate, you're exactly the kind of person that needs to meditate. You know what I mean? There you go, Amber. I love meditating. Cool. Well, Carly, maybe you can teach me some things about meditation. Or if you know of a meditation group, I don't have one locally, Carly. So if you know of a meditation group, I'd love to get that information from you. But otherwise, I'm going to log off and spend the next 30 minutes meditating over a bowl of cornflakes and some coffee. All right. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to say goodbye. And I will talk to you either Wednesday night or on Thursday. Take care. Mm -hmm.